Dear listener, welcome to Sci-Fi Tales. Today, we will continue our series, The Arabian Nights, with a new tale, The Enchanted Horse. Get ready for cosy and dreamy tale that will transport you beyond the realm of dreams. It was the feast of the new year, the oldest and most splendid of all the feasts in the kingdom of Persia, and the day had been spent by the king in the city of Shiraz, taking part in the magnificent spectacles prepared by his subjects to do honour to the festival. The sun was setting, and the monarch was about to give his court the signal to retire, when suddenly an Indian appeared before his throne, leading a horse richly harnessed and looking in every respect exactly like a real one. Sire, said he, prostrating himself as he spoke, although I make my appearance so late before your highness, I can confidently assure you that none of the wonders you have seen during the day can be compared to this horse, if you will dine to cast your ease upon him. I see nothing in it, replied the king, except a clever imitation of a real one, and any skilled workman might do as much. Sire, returned the Indain, it is not of his outward form that I would speak, but of the use that I can make of him. I have only to mount him, and to wish myself in some special place, and no matter how distant it may be, in a very few moments I shall find myself there. It is this, sire, that makes the horse so marvellous, and if your highness will allow me, you can prove it for yourself. The King of Persia, who was interested in everything out of the common, and had never before come across a horse with such qualities, bade the Indian mount the animal and show what he could do. In an instant, the man had vaulted on his back and inquired where the monarchs wished to send him. Do you see that mountain? asked the king, pointing to a huge mass that towered into the sky about three leagues from Shiraz. Go and bring me the leaf of a palm that grows at the foot. The words were hardly out of the king's mouth when the Indian turned a screw placed in the horse's neck, close to the saddle, and the animal bounded like lightning up into the air, and was soon beyond the sight, even of the sharpest eyes. In a quarter of an hour, the Indian was seen returning, bearing in his hand the palm, and guiding his horse to the foot of the throne, he dismounted and laid the leaf before the king. Now, the monarch had no sooner proved the astonishing speed of which the horse was capable, than he longed to possess it himself. And indeed, so sure was he that the Indian would be quite ready to sell it, that he looked upon it as his own already. I never guessed from his mere outside how valuable an animal he was, he remarked to the Indian. And I am grateful to you for having shown me my error, said he. If you will sell it, name your own price. Sire, replied the Indian, I never doubted that a sovereign so wise and accomplished as your highness would do justice to my horse when he once knew its power. And I even went so far as to think it probable that you might wish to possess it. Greatly as I prize it, I will yield it up to your highness on one condition. The horse was not constructed by me, but it was given me by the inventor in exchange for my only daughter, who made me take a solemn oath that I would never part with it, except for some object of equal value. Name anything you like, cried the monarch, interrupting him. My kingdom is large and filled with fair cities. You have only to choose which you would prefer to become its ruler to the end of your life. Sire, answered the Indian, to whom the proposal did not seem nearly so generous as it appeared to the king, I am most grateful to your highness for your princely offer and beseech you not to be offended with me if I say that I can only deliver up my horse in exchange for the hand of the princess, your daughter. A shout of laughter burst from the courtiers as they heard these words, and Prince Firuz Shah, the heir apparent, was filled with anger at the Indian's presumption. The king, however, thought that it would not cost him much to part from the princess in order to gain such a delightful toy, and while he was hesitating as to his answer, the prince broke in. Sire, he said, it is not possible that you can doubt for an instant what reply you should give to such an insolent bargain. Consider what you owe to yourself and to the blood of your ancestors. My son, replied the king, 
You speak nobly, but you do not realise either the value of the horse or the fact that, if I reject the proper soul of the Indian, he will only make the same to some other monarch, and I should be filled with despair at the thought that anyone but myself should own this seventh wonder of the world. Of course, I do not say that I shall accept his conditions, and perhaps he may be brought to reason, but meanwhile, I should like you to examine the horse and, with the owner's permission, to make trial of its powers. The Indian, who had overheard the king's speech, thought that he saw in it signs of yielding to his proposal, so he joyfully agreed to the monarch's wishes and came forward to help the prince to mount the horse and show him how to guide it. But, before he had finished, the young man turned the screw and was soon out of sight. They waited some time, expecting that every moment he might be seen returning in the distance. But at length, the Indian grew frightened and prostrating himself before the throne. He said to the king, Sire, your highness must have noticed that the prince, in his impatience, did not allow me to tell him what it was necessary to do in order to return to the place from which he started. I implore you not to punish me for what was not my fault and not to visit on me any misfortune that may occur. But why? cried the king in a burst of fear and anger. Why did you not call him back when you saw him disappearing? Sire, replied the Indian, the rapidity of his movements took me so by surprise that he was out of hearing before I recovered my speech. But we must hope that he will perceive and turn a second screw, which will have the effect of bringing the horse back to earth. But supposing he does, answered the king, what is to hinder the horse from descending straight into the sea or dashing him to pieces on the rocks? Have no fears, your highness, said the Indian. The horse has the gift of passing over seas and of carrying his rider wherever he wishes to go. Well, your head shall answer for it, returned the monarch, and if in three months he is not safe back with me, or at any rate does not send me news of his safety, your life shall pay the penalty. So saying, he ordered his guards to seize the Indian and throw him into prison. Meanwhile, Prince Firuz Shah had gone gaily up into the air, and for the space of an hour, continued to ascend higher and higher, till the very mountains were not distinguishable from the plains. Then he began to think it was time to come down, and took for granted that, in order to do this, it was only needful to turn the screw the reverse way. But, to his surprise and horror, he found that, turn as he might, he did not make the smallest impression. He then remembered that he had never waited to ask how he was to get back to earth again, and understood the danger in which he stood. Luckily, he did not lose his head, and set about examining the horse's neck with great care, till at last, to his intense joy, he discovered a tiny little peg, much smaller than the other, close to the right ear. This he turned, and found him, self-dropping to the earth, though more slowly than he had left it. It was now dark, and as the prince could see nothing, he was obliged, not without some feeling of disquiet, to allow the horse to direct his own course, and midnight was already passed before Prince Firuz Shah again touched the ground, faint and weary from his long ride, and from the fact that he had eaten nothing since early morning. The first thing he did on dismounting was to try to find out where he was, and, as far as he could discover in the thick darkness, he found himself on the terraced roof of a huge palace with a balustrade of marble running round. In one corner of the terrace stood a small door, opening onto a staircase, which led down into the palace. Some people might have hesitated before exploring further, but not so the prince. I am doing no harm, he said, and whoever the owner may be, he will not touch me when he sees I am unarmed. And in dread of making a false step, he went cautiously down the staircase. On a landing, he noticed an open door, beyond which was a faintly lighted hall. Before entering, the prince paused and listened, but he heard nothing except the sound of men snoring. By the light of a lantern suspended from the roof, he perceived a row of black guards sleeping, each with a naked sword lying by him, and he understood that the hall must form the anteroom to the chamber of some queen or princess. Standing quite still, 
Prince Firuz Shah looked about him till his eyes grew accustomed to the gloom and he noticed a bright light shining through a curtain in one corner. He then made his way softly towards it and drawing aside its folds, passed into a magnificent chamber full of sleeping women, all lying on low couches except one who was on a sofa. And this one, he knew, must be the princess. Gently stealing up to the side of her bed, he looked at her and saw that she was more beautiful than any woman he had ever beheld. But, fascinated though he was, he was well aware of the danger of his position, as one cry of surprise would awake the guards and cause his certain death. So sinking quietly on his knees, he took hold of the sleeve of the princess and drew her arm lightly towards him. The princess opened her eyes and seeing before her a handsome, well-dressed man, she remained speechless with astonishment. This favourable moment was seized by the prince, who bowing low while he knelt, thus addressed her. You behold, madame, a prince in distress, son to the king of Persia, who, owing to an adventure so strange that you will scarcely believe it, finds himself here, a suppliant for your protection. But yesterday I was in my father's court, engaged in the celebration of our most solemn festival. Today I am in an unknown land, in danger of my life. Now the princess, whose mercy Prince Firuz Shah implored, was the eldest daughter of the King of Bengal, who was enjoying rest and change in the palace her father had built her, at a little distance from the capital. She listened kindly to what he had to say, and then answered, Prince, be not uneasy. Hospitality and humanity are practised as widely in Bengal as they are in Persia. The protection you ask will be given you by all. You have my word for it. And as the prince was about to thank her for her goodness, she added quickly, However great may be my curiosity to learn by what means you have travelled here so speedily, I know that you must be faint for want of food, so I shall give orders to my women to take you to one of my chambers where you will be provided with supper and left to repose. By this time, the princess's attendants were all awake and listening to the conversation. At a sign from their mistress, they rose, dressed themselves hastily, and snatching up some of the tapers, which lighted the room, conducted the prince to a large and lofty room, where two of the number prepared his bed, and the rest went down to the kitchen, from which they soon returned with all sorts of dishes. Then, showing him cupboards filled with dresses and linen, they quitted the room. During their absence, the princess of Bengal, who had been greatly struck by the beauty of the prince, tried in vain to go to sleep again. It was of no use. She felt broad awake, and when her women entered the room, she inquired eagerly if the prince had all he wanted and what they thought of him. Madame, they replied, it is of course impossible for us to tell what impression this young man has made on you. For ourselves, we think you would be fortunate if the king your father should allow you to marry anyone so amiable. Certainly there is no one in the court of Bengal who can be compared with him. These flattering observations were by no means displeasing to the princess, but as she did not wish to betray her own feelings, she merely said, You are all a set of chatterboxes. Go back to bed and let me sleep. When she dressed the following morning, her maids noticed that, contrary to her usual habit, the princess was very particular about her toilette and insisted on her hair being dressed two or three times over. For, she said to herself, if my appearance was not displeasing to the prince when he saw me in the condition I was, how much more will he be struck with me when he beholds me with all my charms? Then she placed in her hair the largest and most brilliant diamonds she could find, with a necklace, bracelets and girdle, all of precious stones. And over her shoulders, her ladies put a robe of the richest stuff in all the Indies, that no one was allowed to wear except members of the royal family. When she was fully dressed according to her wishes, she sent to know if the Prince of Persia was awake and ready to receive her, as she desired to present herself before him. When the princess's messenger entered his room, Prince Firuz Shah was in the act of leaving it, to inquire if he might be allowed to pay his homage to her mistress. But on hearing the princess's wishes, he at once gave way, 
Her will is my law, he said. I am only here to obey her orders. In a few moments, the princess herself appeared, and after the usual compliments had passed between them, the princess sat down on a sofa and began to explain to the prince her reasons for not giving him an audience in her own apartments. Had I done so, she said, we might have been interrupted at any hour by the chief of the eunuchs, who has the right to enter whenever it pleases him, whereas this is forbidden ground. I am all impatience to learn the wonderful accident which has procured the pleasure of your arrival, and that is why I have come to you here, where no one can intrude upon us. Begin then, I entreat you, without delay. So the prince began at the beginning, and told all the story of the festival of Nedrus, held yearly in Persia, and of the splendid spectacles celebrated in its honour. But when he came to the enchanted horse, the princess declared that she could never have imagined anything half so surprising. Well then, continued the prince, you can easily understand how the king, my father, who has a passion for all curious things, was seized with a violent desire to possess this horse and asked the Indian what sum he would take for it. The man's answer was absolutely absurd, as you will agree, when I tell you that it was nothing less than the hand of the princess, my sister. But though all the bystanders laughed and mocked, and I was beside myself with rage, I saw to my despair that my father could not make up his mind to treat the insolent proposal as it deserved. I tried to argue with him, but in vain. He only begged me to examine the horse with a view, as I quite understood, of making me more sensible of its value. To please my father, I mounted the horse, and without waiting for any instructions from the Indian, turned the peg as I had seen him do. In an instant, I was soaring upwards, much quicker than an arrow could fly, and I felt as if I must be getting so near the sky that I should soon hit my head against it. I could see nothing beneath me, and for some time was so confused that I did not even know in what direction I was travelling. At last, when it was growing dark, I found another screw, and on turning it, the horse began slowly to sink towards the earth. I was forced to trust to chance and to see what fate had in store, and it was already past midnight when I found myself on the roof of this palace. I crept down the little staircase and made directly for a light which I perceived through an open door. I peeped cautiously in and saw, as you will guess, the eunuchs lying asleep on the floor. I knew the risks I ran, but my need was so great that I paid no attention to them and stole safely past your guards to the curtain which concealed your doorway. The rest, princess, you know, and it only remains for me to thank you for the kindness you have shown me and to assure you of my gratitude. By the law of nations, I am already your slave and I have only my heart, that is my own, to offer you. But what am I saying? My own. Alas, madame, it was yours from the first moment I beheld you. The air with which he said these words could have left no doubt on the mind of the princess as to the effect of her charms, and the blush which mounted to her face only increased her beauty. Prince, returned she, as soon as her confusion permitted her to speak, you have given me the greatest pleasure and I have followed you closely in all your adventures. And though you are positively sitting before me, I even trembled at your danger in the upper regions of the air. Let me say what a debt I owe to the chance that has led you to my house. You could have entered none which would have given you a warmer welcome. As to your being a slave, of course that is merely a joke, and my reception must itself have assured you that you are as free here as at your father's court. As to your heart, continued she in tones of encouragement, I'm quite sure that must have been disposed of long ago to some princess who is well worthy of it, and I could not think of being the cause of your unfaithfulness to her. Prince Firuz Shah was about to protest that there was no lady with any prior claims, but he was stopped by the entrance of one of the princess's attendants, who announced that dinner was served and after all, Neither were sorry for the interruption. Dinner was laid in a magnificent apartment and the table was covered with delicious fruits. While during the repast, 
Richly dressed girls sang softly and sweetly to stringed instruments. After the prince and princess had finished, they passed into a small room hung with blue and gold, looking out into a garden stocked with flowers and arbutus trees, quite different from any that were to be found in Persia. Princess, observed the young man, till now I had always believed that Persia could boast finer palaces and more lovely gardens than any kingdom upon earth, but my eyes have been opened and I begin to perceive that, wherever there is a great king, he will surround himself with buildings worthy of him. Prince, replied the Princess of Bengal, I have no idea what a Persian palace is like, so I am unable to make comparisons. I do not wish to depreciate my own palace, but I can assure you that it is very poor beside that of the king, my father, as you will agree when you have been there to greet him, as I hope you will shortly do. Now the princess hoped that, by bringing about a meeting between the prince and her father, the king would be so struck with the young man's distinguished air and fine manners, that he would offer him his daughter to wife. But the reply of the prince of Persia to her suggestion was not quite what she wished. Madam, he said, by taking advantage of your proposal to visit the palace of the king of Bengal, I should satisfy not merely my curiosity, but also the sentiments of respect with which I regard him. But, princess, I am persuaded that you will feel with me, that I cannot possibly present myself before so great a sovereign without the attendant suitable to my rank. He would think me an adventurer. If that is all, she answered, you can get as many attendants here as you please. There are plenty of Persian merchants, and as for money, my treasury is always open to you. Take what you please. Prince Firuz Shah guessed what prompted so much kindness on the part of the princess, and was much touched by it. Still, his passion, which increased every moment, did not make him forget his duty. So he replied without hesitation, I do not know, princess, how to express my gratitude for your obliging offer, which I would accept at once, if it were not for the recollection of all the uneasiness the king my father must be suffering on my account. I should be unworthy indeed of all the love he showers upon me, if I did not return to him at the first possible moment. For, while I am enjoying the society of the most amiable of all princesses, he is, I am quite convinced, plunged in the deepest grief, having lost all hope of seeing me again. I am sure you will understand my position, and will feel that to remain away one instant longer than is necessary would not only be ungrateful on my part, but perhaps even a crime. For how do I know if my absence may not break his heart? But, continued the prince, having obeyed the voice of my conscience, I shall count the moments when, with your gracious permission, I may present myself before the King of Bengal, not as a wanderer, but as a prince, to implore the favour of your hand. My father has always informed me that in my marriage I shall be left quite free, but I am persuaded that I have only to describe your generosity for my wishes to become his own. The Princess of Bengal was too reasonable not to accept the explanation offered by Prince Firuz Shah but she was much disturbed at his intention of departing at once, for she feared that, no sooner had he left her, than the impression she had made on him would fade away. So she made one more effort to keep him, and after assuring him that she entirely approved of his anxiety to see his father, begged him to give her a day or two more of his company. In common politeness, the prince could hardly refuse this request, and the princess set about inventing every kind of amusement for him, and succeeded so well that two months slipped by almost unnoticed, in balls, spectacles, and in hunting, of which, when unattended by danger, the princess was passionately fond. But at last, one day, he declared seriously that he could neglect his duty no longer, and entreated her to put no further obstacles in his way promising at the same time to return, as soon as he could, with all the magnificence due both to her and to himself. Princess, he added, it may be that in your heart 
You class me with those false lovers whose devotion cannot stand the test of absence. If you do, you wrong me. And were it not for fear of offending you, I would beseech you to come with me. For my life can only be happy when passed with you. As for your reception at the Persian court, it will be as warm as your merits deserve. And as for what concerns the King of Bengal, he must be much more indifferent to your welfare than you have led me to believe if he does not give his consent to our marriage. The princess could not find words in which to reply to the arguments of the Prince of Persia, but her silence and her downcast eyes spoke for her and declared that she had no objection to accompanying him on his travels. The only difficulty that occurred to her was that Prince Firum She did not know how to manage the horse and she dreaded lest they might find themselves in the same plight as before. But the prince soothed her fears so successfully that she soon had no other thought than to arrange for their flight so secretly that no one in the palace should suspect it. This was done, and early the following morning, when the whole palace was wrapped in sleep, she stole up onto the roof, where the prince was already awaiting her, with his horse's head towards Persia. He mounted first and helped the princess up behind. Then, when she was firmly seated, with her hands holding tightly to his belt, he touched the screw, and the horse began to leave the earth quickly behind him. He travelled with his accustomed speed, and Prince Firuz Shah guided him so well that in two hours and a half from the time of starting, he saw the capital of Persia lying beneath him. He determined to alight neither in the great square from which he had started, nor in the Sultan's palace, but in a country house at a little distance from the town. Here, he showed the princess a beautiful suite of rooms and begged her to rest while he informed his father of their arrival and prepared a public reception worthy of her rank. Then he ordered a horse to be saddled and set out. All the way through the streets he was welcomed with shouts of joy by the people, who had long lost all hope of seeing him again. On reaching the palace, he found the Sultan surrounded by his ministers, all clad in the deepest mourning, and his father almost went out of his mind with surprise and delight at the mere sound of his son's voice. When he had calmed down a little, he begged the prince to relate his adventures. The prince at once seized the opening thus given him and told the whole story of his treatment by the princess of Bengal, not even concealing the fact that she had fallen in love with him. And sire, ended the prince, having given my royal word that you would not refuse your consent to our marriage, I persuaded her to return with me on the Indian's horse. I have left her in one of your highness's country houses, where she is waiting anxiously to be assured that I have not promised in vain. As he said this, the prince was about to throw himself at the feet of the sultan, but his father prevented him, and embracing him again, said eagerly, My son, not only do I gladly consent to your marriage with the princess of Bengal, but I will hasten to pay my respects to her, and to thank her in my own person, for the benefits she has conferred on you. I will then bring her back with me and make all arrangements for the wedding to be celebrated today. So the Sultan gave orders that the habits of mourning worn by the people should be thrown off and that there should be a concert of drums, trumpets and cymbals. Also, that the Indian should be taken from prison and brought before him. His commands were obeyed and the Indian was led into his presence surrounded by guards. I have kept you locked up, said the Sultan, so that in case my son was lost, your life should pay the penalty. He has now returned, so take your horse and be gone forever. The Indian hastily quitted the presence of the Sultan, and when he was outside, he inquired of the man who had taken him out of prison where the prince had really been all this time, and what he had been doing. They told him the whole story, and how the Princess of Bengal was even then awaiting in the country palace the consent of the Sultan, which at once put into the Indian's head a plan of revenge for the treatment he had experienced. Going straight to the country house, he informed the doorkeeper, who was left in charge that he had been sent by the Sultan and by the Prince of Persia to fetch the Princess on the enchanted horse and to bring her to the palace. 
the doorkeeper knew the Indian by sight and was, of course, aware that nearly three months before he had been thrown into prison by the Sultan. And seeing him at liberty, the man took for granted that he was speaking the truth and made no difficulty about leading him before the Princess of Bengal, while on her side, hearing that he had come from the prince, the lady gladly consented to do what he wished. The Indian, delighted with the success of his skemi, mounted the horse, assisted the princess to mount behind him, and turned the peg at the very moment that the prince was leaving the palace in Shiraz for the country house, followed closely by the sultan and all the court. Knowing this, the Indian deliberately steered the horse right above the city in order that his revenge for his unjust imprisonment might be all the quicker and sweeter. When the Sultan of Persia saw the horse and its riders, he stopped short with astonishment and horror and broke out into oaths and curses, which the Indian heard quite unmoved, knowing that he was perfectly safe from pursuit. But mortified and furious as the Sultan was, his feelings were nothing to those of Prince Firuz Shah, when he saw the object of his passionate devotion being borne rapidly away. And while he was struck speechless with grief and remorse at not having guarded her better, she vanished swiftly out of his sight. What was he to do? Should he follow his father into the palace and there give reins to his despair? Both his love and his courage alike forbade it, and he continued his way to the palace. The sight of the prince showed the doorkeeper of what folly he had been guilty, and flinging himself at his master's feet, implored his pardon. Rise, said the prince, I am the cause of this misfortune, and not you. Go and find me the dress of a dervish, but beware of saying it is for me. At a short distance from the country house, a convent of dervishes was situated, and the superior, or shy, was the doorkeeper's friend. So, by means of a false story, made up on the spur of the moment, it was easy enough to get hold of a dervish's dress, which the prince at once put on, instead of his own. Disguised like this, and concealing about him a box of pearls and diamonds, he had intended as a present to the princess. He left the house at nightfall, uncertain where he should go, but firmly resolved not to return without her. Meanwhile, the Indian had turned the horse in such a direction that, before many hours had passed, it had entered a wood close to the capital of the Kingdom of Kashmir. Feeling very hungry, and supposing that the princess also might be in want of food, he brought his steed down to the earth, and left the princess in a shady place, on the banks of a clear stream. At first, when the princess had found herself alone, the idea had occurred to her of trying to escape and hide herself. But as she had eaten scarcely anything since she had left Bengal, she felt she was too weak to venture far and was obliged to abandon her design. On the return of the Indian with meats of various kinds, she began to eat voraciously and soon had regained sufficient courage to reply with spirit to his insolent remarks. Goaded by his threats, she sprang to her feet, calling loudly for help. And luckily, her cries were heard by a troop of horsemen who rode up to inquire what was the matter. Now the leader of these horsemen was the Sultan of Kashmir, returning from the chase, and he instantly turned to the Indian to inquire who he was and whom he had with him. The Indian rudely answered that it was his wife, and there was no occasion for anyone else to interfere between them. The princess, who, of course, was ignorant of the rank of her deliverer, denied altogether the Indian story. My lord, she cried, whoever you may be, put no faith in this imposter. He is an abominable magician who has this day torn me from the Prince of Persia, my destined husband, and has brought me here on this enchanted horsey. She would have continued, but her tears chocked her and the Sultan of Kashmir, convinced by her beauty, and her distinguished air of the truth of her tale, ordered his followers to cut off the Indian's heed, which was done immediately. But rescued though she was from one peril, it seemed as if she had only fallen into another. The Sultan commanded a horse to be given her, 
and conducted her to his own palace, where he led her to a beautiful apartment and selected female slaves to wait on her and eunuchs to be her guard. Then, without allowing her time to thank him for all he had done, he bade her repose, saying she should tell him her adventures on the following day. The princess fell asleep, flattering herself that she had only to relate her story for the sultan to be touched by compassion and to restore her to the prince without delay. But a few hours were to undeceive her. When the king of Kashmir had quitted her presence the evening before, he had resolved that the sun should not set again without the princess becoming his wife. And at daybreak, proclamation of his intention was made throughout the town by the sound of drums, trumpets, cymbals, and other instruments calculated to fill the heart with joy. The princess of Bengal was early awakened by the noise, but she did not for one moment imagine that it had anything to do with her, till the sultan, arriving as soon as she was dressed to inquire after her health, informed her that the trumpet blasts she heard were part of the solemn marriage ceremonies, for which he begged her to prepare. This unexpected announcement caused the princess such terror that she sank down in a dead faint. The slaves that were in waiting ran to her aid, and the sultan himself did his best to bring her back to consciousness, but for a long while it was all to no purpose. At length her senses began slowly to come back to her, and then, rather than break faith with the prince of Persia by consenting to such a marriage, she determined to feign madness. So she began by saying all sorts of absurdities and using all kinds of strange gestures, while the sultan stood watching her with sorrow and surprise. But as this sudden seizure showed no sign of abating, he left her to her women, ordering them to take the greatest care of her. Still, as the day went on, the malady seemed to become worse, and by night it was almost violent. Days passed in this manner, till at last, the Sultan of Kashmir decided to summon all the doctors of his court to consult together over her sad state. Their answer was that madness is of so many different kinds that it was impossible to give an opinion on the case without seeing the princess. So the Sultan gave orders that they were to be introduced into her chamber, one by one, every man according to his rank. This decision had been foreseen by the princess, who knew quite well that if once she allowed the physicians to feel her pulse, the most ignorant of them would discover that she was in perfectly good health and that her madness was feigned. So as each man approached, she broke out into such violent paroxysms that not one dared to lay a finger on her. A few, who pretended to be cleverer than the rest, declared that they could diagnose sick people only from sight, ordered her certain potions, which she made no difficulty about taking as she was persuaded they were all harmless. When the Sultan of Kashmir saw that the court doctors could do nothing towards curing the princess, he called in those of the city who fared no better. Then he had recourse to the most celebrated physicians in the other large towns, but finding that the task was beyond their science, he finally sent messengers into the other neighboring states with a memorandum containing full particulars of the princess's madness offering, at the same time, to pay the expenses of any physician who would come and see for himself, and a handsome reward to the one who should cure her. In answer to this proclamation, many foreign professors flocked into Kashmir, but they naturally were not more successful than the rest had been, as the cure depended neither on them nor their skill, but only on the princess herself. It was during this time that Prince Firuz Shah wandering sadly and hopelessly from place to place, arrived in a large city of India, where he heard a great deal of talk about the Princess of Bengal, who had gone out of her senses on the very day that she was to have been married to the Sultan of Kashmir. This was quite enough to induce him to take the road to Kashmir and to inquire at the first inn at which he lodged in the capital the full particulars of the story. When he knew that he had at last found the princess, whom he had so long lost, he set about devising a plan for her rescue. The first thing he did was to procure a doctor's robe, so that his dress, added to the long beard he had allowed to grow on his travels, might unmistakably proclaim his profession. 
He then lost no time in going to the palace, where he obtained an audience of the chief usher, and while apologising for his boldness in presuming to think that he could cure the princess, where so many others had failed, declared that he had the secret of certain remedies, which had hitherto never failed of their effect. The chief usher assured him that he was heartily welcome, and that the sultan would receive him with pleasure, and in case of success, he would gain a magnificent reward. When the Prince of Persia, in the disguise of a physician, was brought before him, the Sultan wasted no time in talking, beyond remarking that the mere sight of a doctor threw the princess into transports of rage. He then led the prince up to a room under the roof, which had an opening through which he might observe the princess without himself being seen. The prince looked and beheld the princess, reclining on a sofa with tears in her eyes, singing softly to herself a song bewailing her sad destiny, which had deprived her, perhaps forever, of a being she so tenderly loved. The young man's heart beat fast as he listened, for he needed no further proof that her madness was feigned, and that it was love of him which had caused her to resort to this species of trick. He softly left his hiding place and returned to the Sultan, to whom he reported that he was sure from certain signs that the princess's malady was not incurable, but that he must see her and speak with her alone. The Sultan made no difficulty in consenting to this and commanded that he should be ushered in to the princess's apartment. The moment she caught sight of his physician's robe, she sprang from her seat in a fury and heaped insults upon him. The prince took no notice of her behavior and approaching quite close, so that his words might be heard by her alone. He said in a low whisper, Look at me, princess, and you will see that I am no doctor, but the prince of Persia, who has come to set you free. At the sound of his voice, the princess of Bengal suddenly grew calm, and an expression of joy overspread her face, such as only comes when what we wish for most and expect the least suddenly happens to us. For some time, she was too enchanted to speak, and Prince Firuz Shah took advantage of her silence to explain to her all that had occurred, his despair at watching her disappear before his very eyes, the oath he had sworn to follow her over the world, and his rapture at finally discovering her in the palace at Kashmir. When he had finished, he begged in his turn that the princess would tell him how she had come there, so that he might the better devise some means of rescuing her from the tyranny of the Sultan. It needed but a few words from the princess to make him acquainted with the whole situation and how she had been forced to play the part of a mad woman in order to escape from a marriage with the Sultan who had not had sufficient politeness even to ask her consent. If necessary, she added, she had resolved to die sooner than permit herself to be forced into such a union and break faith with a prince whom she loved. The prince then inquired if she knew what had become of the enchanted horse since the Indian's death, but the princess could only reply that she had heard nothing about it. Still, she did not suppose that the horse could have been forgotten by the sultan, after all she had told him of its value. To this the prince agreed, and they consulted together over a plan by which she might be able to make her escape and return with him into Persia. And as the first step, she was to dress herself with care and receive the Sultan with civility when he visited her next morning. The Sultan was transported with delight on learning the result of the interview and his opinion of the doctor's skill was raised still higher when on the following day the princess behaved towards him in such a way as to persuade him that her complete cure would not be long delayed. However, he contented himself with assuring her how happy he was to see her health so much improved and exhorted her to make every use of so clever a physician and to repose entire confidence in him. Then he retired without awaiting any reply from the princess. The prince of Persia left the room at the same time and asked if he might be allowed humbly to inquire by what means the princess of Bengal had reached Kashmir which was so far distant from her father's kingdom, and how she came to be there alone. The Sultan thought the question very natural, and told him the same story that the Princess of Bengal had done, adding 
that he had ordered the enchanted horse to be taken, to his trissuri as a curiosity, though he was quite ignorant how it could be you seed. Siri, replied the physician, your highness's taily has supplied me with the clue I needed to complete the recovery of the princess. During her voyage, hither on an enchanted horse, a portion of its enchantment has by some means been communicated to her person, and it can only be dissipated by certain perfumes of which I possess the secret. If your highness will deign to consent and to give the court and the people one of the most astonishing spectacles they have ever witnessed, command the horse to be brought into the big square outside the palace and leave the rest to me. I promise that in a very few moments, in presence of all the assembled multitude, you shall see the princess as healthy, both in mind and body, as ever she was in her life. And in order to make the spectacle as impressive as possible, I would suggest that she should be richly dressed and covered with the noblest jewels of the crown. The Sultan readily agreed to all that the prince proposed, and the following morning, he desired that the enchanted horse should be taken from the treasury and brought into the great square of the palace. Soon the rumour began to spread through the town that something extraordinary was about to happen, and such a crowd began to collect that the guards had to be called out to keep order and to make a way for the enchanted horse. When all was ready, the Sultan appeared and took his place on a platform, surrounded by the chief nobles and officers of his court. When they were seated, the Princess of Bengal was seen leaving the palace, accompanied by the ladies who had been assigned to her by the Sultan. She slowly approached the enchanted horse and with the help of her ladies, she mounted on its back. Directly she was in the saddle, with her feet in the stirrups and the bridle in her hand, the physician placed around the horse some large braziers, full of burning coals, into each of which he threw a perfume composed of all sorts of delicious scents. Then he crossed his hands over his breast and with lowered eyes walked three times round the horse, muttering the while certain words. Soon there arose from the burning braziers a thick smoke which almost concealed both the horse and princess, and this was the moment for which he had been waiting. Springing lightly up behind the lady, he leaned forward and turned the peg, and as the horse darted up into the air, he cried aloud, so that his words were heard by all present. Sultan of Kashmir, when you wish to marry princesses who have sought your protection, learn first to gain their consent. It was in this way that the Prince of Persia rescued the Princess of Bengal and returned with her to Persia, where they descended this time before the palace of the king himself. The marriage was only delayed just long enough to make the ceremony as brilliant as possible. And, as soon as the rejoicings were over, an ambassador was sent to the King of Bengal to inform him of what had passed and to ask his approbation of the alliance between the two countries, which he heartily gave.